All right. So let's pray, because uh, I'm up here and you're not. So, Father, <laughs> right. oh, Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you that your son is worthy. Thank you that that you're God and we're not. Abba, as we dig into your word and we get to, to learn from you, God, I just pray you would speak to our hearts. You would remove any blinders or anything that might take away from us hearing from you. Open our ears to hear from you. Open our eyes to see you. And open our mind to understand you. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, I, I was going back and forth really on what I wanted to talk about, and uh, I kind of came down to this one thing. It just kept coming back to my mind, and it's God's affection for us, God's desire for us. And so for that, we're going to look at uh, two specific incidents in Exodus. And so the first one we're going to look at is Exodus 20, starting in 18, verse 18 through 21. So it says, all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. So when I first read this, I started really kind of thinking, man, this was a, a huge opportunity for Israel. This wasn't a small little opportunity. Up until this moment, remember, Moses spoke to God. He saw him in the burning bush. Moses was the one who was going through everything. Moses was the one who went and they, you know, took Aaron with him and laid down the staff and all of that. So up until this moment, God was always speaking to Moses. And now it reaches a point, right? And God goes, hey, listen, uh, Moses, make, tell them to come over to the mountain because I want to talk to them. And what does Israel do? They're like, uh, you know, Moses, man, it's thunder. Man, that's a, a booming voice. We're good, Moses. Go ahead and speak, man. We're good. And everybody is, is sitting there, and they're standing back, and they said they went and they stood back at a distance. The reason this is so important is because this would then begin something that would haunt Israel for really a long time. In Exodus 33, starting in verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent, that all the people would arise and stand each at the entrance of his tent and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever, the t sorry, whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship at the entrance of the tent of at the entrance of his tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So I told you they decided they wanted to stand at a distance, and God made sure that they would stand at a distance from that day on. Moses would pitch the tent outside the camp, and everybody would come to the entrance of their tent, and they would worship at a distance. I don't know about you, but if I was them, I would want to be with Joshua. I would want to be with Moses. But they decided that it was good enough for them to stand at the entrance. So my question to you today is, which one are you? Are you standing at a distance and you want God to speak to you either through the pastor, either through some evangelist you're watching on TV, either through some book you're reading? Or are you willing to go and say, it's not enough? It's not enough. In my own life, I kept looking at everything that happened to me. And I'm going to tell you, it's not some 
easy thing that has happened to me. There's been a lot of stuff that has happened in my life from losing my best friend in a car accident. Uh, I'm going to give you an example in 2017. Just in 2017, I had one of my former players die in a car accident, 23 years old. I had one of my, my youth members at the time, we were talking about, and this is, you know, it's, it's interesting how Satan works. Because we, have, we just sat down and we were talking about how things will happen to us and then we're going to have to reach a point where we're going to go, either you're going to follow Christ through it or you're not. Either you're going to walk with Christ through it or you're not. And this kid went home, he went to sleep, we had an all-nighter, he went to sleep, decided he wasn't going to stay home and went to a friend's house. Later on, I get a phone call that his brother burned down his house. And on the phone, these were his exact words to me. I don't think I can do it. Tired, exhausted, I jumped up from my bed. I said, I'm on my way. I picked him up at his grandma's house, and for about two hours, we sat and talked. We make choices. A little while after that, someone who was once in my youth group about to graduate was murdered at a park. This is all within months. This is all within months. And the tendency for us to do is to start stepping backwards from God. We have a tendency to start going, I'll worship God from a distance because every time I seem to draw close to Him, things go pretty awry. They go pretty crazy. Israel had a choice and they made their choice. What's so interesting, if you read the first, it, he, Moses is talking to him and he goes, I, God wants you to, to fear him. He, he wants to remind you so you stay from sin. Because what happened when Moses went up the mountain? Does anybody remember? What did the people do? They sinned. So even before Moses goes up, God's going, listen, hey guys, uh, I just want to tell you, I know what you're about to do. I know. So please draw near to me. So you won't sin? And the people are like, no, we're good. Here's the interesting thing I just, I realized as I was studying through this, is that every single one of those Israelites did not enter the promised land. Think about that for a moment. They had a chance to draw close. They had a chance to be in God's presence. And they decided that, no, I, I want to stand at a distance. I would, I would rather be in the back. I would rather stand at the entrance of my tent and worship God from afar. And what we do is when we worship God from afar, we think that God can't see us. God can't see our sin. God can't see where we're going. We, we think that that distance somehow makes him blind. God can see far and near. He has 20-20 vision. He doesn't need glasses. Which one are you? God longs for us to draw near to him. He longs for it. That's his longing. How do we know this? In Genesis, he walked with Adam and Eve during the cool of the day. He walked with them. He's walking with them, talking with them. Again, in Genesis, he wrestles with Jacob. We see throughout the scripture God drawing near to his people and saying, just come. David would write and talk about leaning on God's breast underneath his wings. We see it. In the New Testament, we see him sending his one and only son to die on a cross for us. And yet we stand at a distance. We stand at a distance. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of your affection? Is he worthy of your praise? Is he worthy? Do, do you ask yourself that question? Do you wake up in the morning and go, is he worthy? Are you willing to sit there and have God say, will you draw near to me this morning? Will you come to me this morning? Or are you going to go, God, I'm too busy. I got a pretty busy schedule today. I got a pretty hectic one. Are you willing to go and draw into his presence every breath, every moment? This is my desire. I'm not perfect. I want to tell you that now. I'm not perfect. There's nobody here that's perfect. But 
Does your desire, is your desire to go deeper with the things of God? Is your desire to draw into his presence? Is your desire to come up and go, hey, God, I can't breathe because of what you're doing to me. Moses walks into the smoke. Moses goes up the mountain and God speaks to him. I love how it says face to face as a friend speaks. Do you desire that? Moses had this experience, right? He's going up the mountain. He gets the Ten Commandments. He comes down. He sees them sitting. And what does he do? He throws them. He's mad. He threw a temper tantrum. What is happening? Shatters them. And I'm pretty sure his next, his next thing right after that was, oh, man, what did I just do? And then he's got to slap back up there and go, God. Man, I messed up. I broke them. I broke all the commandments. Not, not literally. God, I, I threw them down. I, I, I didn't break them all, you know. I didn't covet and stuff. But he goes up. <laughs> Moses saw the burning bush. Moses saw God split the Red Sea. Moses was part of the miracle of the water coming out of the rock. And in the midst of that, Moses still goes, that's not enough. I want to see your face. I want to see your face, God. All of that is great, man. You speaking to me is awesome. You move my heart. You stir my heart. But God, that's not enough. I got to see your face. I want to see your face. I want to see everything about you. I want to see every wrinkle. I want to know everything about you. And in the midst of that, what does God tell him? What does God tell him? No man can what? No man can see me and live. So he goes, but I got a good idea. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'm going to pass by. And when I pass by, I'm going to remove my hand and you can see what? My back. Even in the midst of all the things that God did with Moses, Moses is like, that's not enough. That's not enough. I want more. I want more. I want more. When I was a teenager in high school, I'll never forget this story. I was at camp and one of the, the pastors was preaching and he goes, I want to tell you what heaven's going to be like. And when you're a teenager, you hear that. You're like, whoa, wait, what? Hello. Streets of gold. Let's talk about it. Let's go. And he's like, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, he told us a story, and he said one day he was speaking with a friend, and they were talking about heaven, and they were like, man, heaven's going to be so awesome. The streets of gold, the huge diamonds, the pearls. I mean, they're just going through all this stuff. I don't know what they were talking about, first of all. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, awesome. And he goes, his friend looks at him, and he goes, man, you know, that's great. The streets of gold is great. My mansion is going to be great. He said, but none of that, none of that matters to me. The only thing that matters to me is someone might touch Jesus' feet before I do. And then he went on and he said, I'm going to tell you what heaven's going to be like. He's like, we're going to get to heaven. We're going to be so in awe of God that we're just going to fall down where we're at and we're going to worship. He goes, and we're going to worship for a thousand years. And we're there just worshiping and we're like, God, you're so awesome. And we're just worshiping. And he goes, and then we get up and we're like, okay, let's go see the mansion. And God's just going to turn a little bit. And we're going to fall on our face again and worship for another thousand years. He's like, it's going to be a game to God. God's going to be like, oh, yeah, you're good. Watch something new. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Check it out. And we're going to fall down and worship again for a thousand years. And I, as, I, as I listen to that, and this is how much it stirred my heart. Because I never forgot that story. I never forgot that picture in my head. And, and I'm glad I never forgot that picture in my head. Because years later, I would have to say goodbye to my best friend. I would have to bury him. Years later, I would have to say goodbye to many more people in my life. And one hope that we have is that we get to see them in heaven. And I think about that so often. I think about that. And I think about worshiping God for a thousand years. I think about seeing with them. You know, when my aunt died, I told me and my mom, we used to, we used to, I used to give her a hard time. Because she was just awesome. 
you know? And she would come to my house and she would wait for her son who had Down syndrome to get off the bus. And she would sit there and she would give me a hard time. I would come outside and she'd be like, oh, you again? And I'm like, hey, sit down, little woman. Don't say a word. <laughs> and I told her, I told her, I said, because she was like, you know, Shane, this is ridiculous. And I said, well, you know what's going to be even more ridiculous? The fact that you're going to be sitting on a swing with me in heaven for all eternity. So get used to it, woman. But to me, and she went on and she passed on and, and, and left behind a son with Down syndrome. And, and it was hard to say goodbye. But I think about those moments. I think about drawing near to God. I think about those things. Why? Because in the midst of all of that, we, we, we experience God. Have you experienced God today? Have you experienced him lately in your life? We can stand at a distance. Or we can draw near. God's number one desire for us is to just draw near into his presence. That's what he wants. We were created to worship, believe it or not. We were. We were created for that. We were created to be with him, to be intimate with him. Adam and Eve didn't realize how awesome they had to be able to sit and walk with God in the pool of the day. To be able to just walk, to go here and just, what's up, God? How you doing? Everything's awesome? How was your day? My day was awesome. Today I named a lion. I named it lion today. So my day was very successful today, God. And God's like, I know, I saw it. And God's walking and talking with them. And in the midst of that, they desired sin more than they desired him. And ever since then, we've been doing the same thing. That's what we learned from Israel. Ever since then, we've been desiring the same thing. We've been desiring the sin and the things and the pleasures of the world more than we've been desiring Christ. We've been chasing after the things of the world more than we've been chasing after Christ. And Christ is going, come on, come on in, draw close. See, here's the thing. And, and I'm going to say something from a movie real quick. Everyone see Frosty the Snowman? Frosty the Snowman in one scene he was talking, I don't remember which Frosty, but I know this one girl was saying how she wouldn't she wasn't listening to me. I think it was in the new one. And so he goes, You know what I do when people aren't listening to me? And he's like, she's like, What? He goes, I whisper. Because if I whisper, what do you have to do? You gotta lean in. We see it throughout scripture. God wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the wind. He was in what? A whisper. That's why God desires for us to draw close so he can whisper in our ear. So he can say the words, I love you. Brendan Manning used to say this. He said, God loves us exactly as we are, not as we should be. Because we will never be as we should be. That's God's number one desire for us. So, will you be like Israel and stand at a distance? Or will you come in? In James 4, verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Man, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. I want you to imagine what it would have been like to be with Israel. To see that mountain. To see the smoke. To hear the thunder. I want you to imagine what it was like in the midst of that watching and hearing Moses go, God wants you to draw near. God wants you to come near. I want, you, I want you to think about what it was like to step out of your tent and see this cloud descending upon the tent as Moses walks in and Joshua is sitting there. See, I wouldn't be like Joshua, too. Man, they said Joshua wouldn't leave the tent. He would just sit there. When was the last time you just sat with God? One of the first things my mentor had me do is he had me go and find a tree. And he said, I want you to sit with God for 10 minutes. That's it, 10 minutes. 
He says, sit with him for 10 minutes, ask three questions, and that's it. I want to tell you something. That was the longest 10 minutes of my life. I sat there and I asked the three questions, I answered it in like three minutes. And then I just sat there and I was like, all right. Seven minutes, six minutes, and I'm starting to look up and I'm looking at the tree. And when I got done, I finally realized what my mentor wanted me to do all along to just sit with God. And I can tell you this, sooner than later, 10 minutes became 30 minutes, became an hour, became two hours, and it was the most amazing time that I've ever spent with God. Just sitting under the tree, sometimes doing nothing, just sitting there. When was the last time you sat with God? When was the last time that you sat in His presence? When was the last time that you just said, God, I just wanna be with you? When was the last time? I'm going short, really short today, because I'm about to end, so I just want to tell you that. I have one last story. It's by Brennan Manning as well. True story too. Brennan Manning said that uh, one night he was sitting at his house, and all of a sudden the doorbell rang. And he opens the door, and there was this woman standing there. The woman looked at him and said, Brennan, you don't know me, and I don't really know you but I got your name from a friend. You see, my dad's about to die. I've asked the priest several times to please come to our house and speak with my dad. The priest has said every time I will and then has forgotten. Can you please come to my house? Brennan Manning said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Brennan Manning walks into the house and he goes back into the room. And as he walks into the room, the man is sitting, laying in his bed and there's a chair next to his bed. He looks at him and he goes, hi, I'm Brennan Manning, but you must know that you must have been expecting me. And the man looked at him and said, no, who are you? And he said, Brennan Manning, I was sure your daughter told you. And he goes, no, why would you assume that? He goes, well, I see the chair, the empty chair. He goes, oh, the empty chair. Let me tell you about it. Come on in, close the door. So Brennan walks in, and when he walks in, the man says, I had a hard time praying. And so I went to the, the church, and the pastor was talking all about prayer. And he starts talking about prayer and he's talking about how, what you need to do to pray. And, and, I, and I said, okay, that's interesting. And he walks up to the pastor afterwards or the priest afterwards and he goes, hey, everything you say about prayer goes right over my head. I have no idea what you're talking about. So the, the priest reaches into his desk and he hands him a book about prayer and he says, read this. He told him, he said, Brennan, the first three pages I had to look up 11 words in the dictionary. So I walked back and went to the past, to the priest and said, here you go, thank you. And under my breath, I said, for nothing. He goes, I walked out just as discouraged as ever, and I never prayed again. Four years ago, I sat with a friend of mine and we were talking about prayer. He goes, this man is not a very spiritual man. But my friend looked at me and said, prayer is just like talking to your best friend. He said, so here's what you do. You sit in a chair and you place an empty chair in front of you and you imagine your best friend sitting there or God sitting there and you talk to him. He said, Brandon, I've been doing that for four years. He goes, now I do it in secret because I don't want my daughter to see me and say, daddy's crazy. He's talking to an empty chair. Time to go to the loony bin. <laughs> so he looked at Brandon and he said, Brandon, I'm not sure if that's spirituality. I'm not sure if that's real prayer, but that's how I do it. And he said, sometimes I will talk for two hours, but that's how I do it. Brennan looked at him and said, if every person could understand that, that's what all that prayer is. All that prayer is, is talking to your best friend. How much better would we be off? And he left. Three days later, the woman returned to, her, to his house and rang the doorbell and said, Brennan, I just came to tell you, last night my dad passed away. He said, looked at her and said, well, did he seem to go in peace? And she said, you know, Brennan, it's interesting. Before my dad died, I told him I was going to the store. He called me over and he said, come here. He told me some corny joke, kissed me on the head, and said, I'll see you when you get back. She said, when I got back from the store, he, he had passed away. He said, but the interesting thing was, Brendan, we don't know what he was trying to do, but when we found him, we found him with his head laying in an empty chair next to his bed. The question is, do you know that God? Do you know the God that says, come, sit on my lap? Do you know the God that says, place your head on my lap? 
find rest, to find peace. Draw near to me. I hope and pray that you will know that God. The God that's not content for us worshiping or talking to him at a distance, but the God that says, come near, sit on my lap. The way that a father does to a young child. He lifts him up, places him on the lap, and begins to talk to him. Begins to talk to her. Begins to love her. Hold her. Every moment is precious to that father or to that mother. Every moment that God has with you is precious. Every moment that he spends talking to you is precious. Every moment that we decide to go and sit on his lap and spend time with him in the midst of our day, he finds that precious. Do you know that God? I want to know that God. I want to know that God. And maybe at the end of my life, I'll place my head in his lap and he can take me home. That's the God that I want to know. That's the depth that I want to go with him. Let's bow our heads. Oh, Abba, my Papa, my Daddy, how I desire to know you deeply, to draw into your presence, to rest in your presence. Abba, every moment spent with you is precious, and sometimes we may forget that. Sometimes we may reach the end and we just go, God, I'm just so tired today. So many times in my life I've said that. So many times in my life I've said, God, I'm just way too tired today. I can't make it today. And you do like any great dad does. You draw me onto your lap and you sit with me and you talk with me. Abba, my prayer for every single person here, no matter age, no matter race, no matter anything, God, is that their number one desire would be to draw to you, to draw close to you, to sit with you, to weep with you, to laugh with you, to love with you. Thank you, Abba. In your name I pray. Amen.